All right, let's get to those latest NFL headlines here on the program. We've got breaking news here in the NFL. Safety Eric Reed has filed a collusion case against the National Football League, essentially alleging that the 32 NFL owners have worked against Eric Reed in essentially keeping him out of the NFL. And Colin Kaepernick, good buddies with Eric Reed. You see Cap right there on your screen. Reed was one of the first people to kneel before and alongside Colin Kaepernick. And now Reed has filed his own collusion case against the NFL. Collusion cases are very difficult to prove. What you have to essentially do is provide evidence that shows that all 32 owners got together in a conference room or whatever the case may be and said, we are going to keep X player out of the NFL because he did this. So this is obviously a developing story here. This news just broke before the Cam Rogers show went on air. So I'm still gathering as much information as I can for you guys. But obviously a big time story. It's today's top story across the NFL. And I said this before with the Colin Kaepernick collusion case. We're going to see more of this. This is not the end. More players are going to feel comfortable with filing these collusion cases if they are kept out of the NFL. Eric Reed feels that he wants to bring this before the NFL and before an arbitrator and get it figured out. And Kaepernick has gone through several depositions with NFL GMs and coaches, Pete Carroll, John Harbaugh of the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Jerry Jones was involved in this as well the owner for the Miami Dolphins too. So the list goes on. It's an ongoing situation here with Kaepernick and it's just starting up for Eric Reed filing a collusion case against the NFL. Once again, Reed was one of the first kneelers alongside Colin Kaepernick during the national anthem. All right, so that's the big time story here across the NFL. Let's get to some more headlines here. The Patriots reportedly wanted Baker Mayfield. So what a story this is. The Patriots wanted to bring in Mayfield for a visit, but were repeatedly denied for obvious reasons. I mean, he didn't think he'd fall to number 23 overall, right? So that makes sense why Baker Mayfield denied it. Now, Patriots offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels called a member of the Mayfield camp, indicating the Patriots may be trading up to number two overall and to draft Baker Mayfield. All right, so this comes amid reports several other teams out there actually were looking into Mayfield as their top quarterback for the 2018 NFL Draft. One team official said the following, quote, the kid has great swagger. I've never been around a guy that attracts people like that. The shotgun thing is not going to hurt him. The level of competition and height are real, but he'll do fine if he gets the ball out on time. So Baker Mayfield was highly regarded by many NFL GMs and front office people and coaches, etc. And obviously the Cleveland Browns probably couldn't have waited to number four overall to grab Baker Mayfield. They had to do it at number one. They obviously did do that. But the big time takeaway for me is I am like shocked that NFL teams held Baker Mayfield in such high regard. And I'm not saying I'm shocked from an ability standpoint because I have been saying that Mayfield is the most polished quarterback out of this entire draft class. What I was shocked about was we didn't hear a lot of buzz about that. We heard buzz about Rosen and Darnold and Allen and Lamar Jackson and the New England Patriots, but not Baker Mayfield as being the top quarterback on several GMs' boards. So that was surprising for me to see there. I do believe he is the most NFL ready Surely from a mental standpoint, he's got that competitiveness, the grittiness. He'll fit really well there in Ohio. A lot of blue collar people up there that work really hard. Great folks in the state of Ohio. Cleveland also in a good position for Baker Mayfield to succeed. Offensive coordinator Todd Haley there. He's never really been a system guy. He fits to the strengths of 
who the personnel is at that point in time. And I think he'll do a good job with Baker Mayfield, but the Patriots tried and they couldn't get him. And so the fallback for New England was Danny Etling, quarterback out of LSU, and that's not going to pan out great. He's a career backup in my eyes. So that's the deal with Baker. Let's get to Shad Khan, owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he's reportedly working on a purchase of Wembley Stadium in London. And how about this? He wants to push for some of the biggest events at that stadium, including the World Cup final, which makes sense because it's in London and they love their soccer across the pond, but also the Super Bowl. Now, who knows if Khan has support, support of this within the league office, but I think this is a bad idea. Like, players have complained before about going overseas to just play a single NFL game. And we're hearing talks about an entire NFL franchise over there, now a Super Bowl. London, I mean, no offense to the people that live in London or anything, but it's like cold and damp and cloudy and rainy and really not fun. Like, you want to be in Tampa Bay or Texas or California for the Super Bowl, right? Where it's sunny and nice outside, the weather's good and all this stuff, and Wembley Stadium just doesn't make all that much sense for me for the Super Bowl. Sure, a couple of games here and there across the pond would be nice, and to grow the game outside of the continental United States, but I can tell you this much. The players definitely will not want a Super Bowl in London. I'm sure they don't want a franchise in the UK either. Players have complained publicly before. Like I mentioned, Kenny Britt has done so, Todd Gurley has done so, many other players as well. So a place like Atlanta, Dallas, these locations are way better than playing a Super Bowl in London. Do you want a Super Bowl in London, ladies and gentlemen? Especially for the people in California, right? Who maybe want to go to the Super Bowl and they gotta travel, what is it, like 16 hours? Probably more? You know, I don't really know uh, my time very well in terms of travel distance from California to London. But obviously, a, a story worth watching here. Shad Khan working towards purchasing Wembley Stadium and perhaps bringing the Super Bowl to the UK. I already see the comments. Constance, Constantine saying no Super Bowl for London. Some other people chiming in as well. All right, let's get to another storyline here. The Saints have signed JT Barrett, quarterback out of Ohio State. So he went undrafted, and he has a new home now, and a lot of people thought that he wasn't going to go drafted, so, you know, this was not a shock. But I think this is interesting. So the Colts actually invited him for a workout, and other teams showed interest as well, but obviously chose the New Orleans Saints. The Saints have... Tom Savage currently as the backup to Drew Brees, I actually think JT Barrett could beat out Tom Savage. Tom Savage is not a good quarterback. All right, Chase Daniel no longer there, so the backup situation here is certainly up in the air. Brees is 39 years old. He's going to need some sort of successor at some point, right? And uh, New Orleans doesn't have a first-round pick in 2019. And the draft class for quarterbacks out there ain't very good. So JT Barrett is a sneaky name to watch out for as we go throughout OTAs and training camp. Somebody who could perhaps beat out Tom Savage and be the heir to Drew Brees in New Orleans. Not likely. He needs a lot of work, especially in terms of his accuracy and ball placement. But JT Barrett, now a member of the New Orleans Saints. Somebody asked about the latest on Dez Bryant. I've got you guys covered. There ain't much, so I've been tracking all I possibly can for you guys, but here is one little update. Tony Romo recently chimed in on the matter, saying, quote, if I was talking to any of the GMs or coaches, I would tell them he's not going to hurt the locker room in any possible way. So Tony Romo vouching for Des Bryant as a teammate. In general, though, things are fairly quiet on the Des Bryant front, the Baltimore Ravens reportedly gave Des an offer that he rejected. 
Dez, from a personal standpoint, I feel hurt. I don't know why you don't want to go to Baltimore and play with Joe Flacco and Michael Crabtree and John Harbaugh. But whatever, it's fine. I'm okay. I'm not hurt about it. It's fine, Dez. Uh, of course, Bryant would like to remain in the NFC East for obvious reasons. He wants revenge against the Dallas Cowboys. He wants to play them at least twice a year. That's why the Giants, the Redskins, the Eagles have been rumored for perhaps bringing in Des Bryant. The Eagles just don't make sense. The Giants don't make much sense either. The Redskins, from a financial standpoint, perhaps make some sense because they have the salary cap space to do it. But I just don't see where Des Bryant fits with Washington. So there you go. Des hasn't had a 1,000-yard receiving season since 2014. He had 69 catches for 883 yards, six touchdowns in 2017. Now, how about this? Dallas Cowboys scouting chief Will McClay recently said the major issue with Dez was his inability to win outside, to create separation. This is not me saying this. This is the Cowboys scouting chief. So for all of you YouTube commenters out there, because I know you're ready to fire off at me to blame Dak and all this stuff, the offensive line, the Zeke suspension, the tape shows, according to a Dallas Cowboys official, that Des Bryant could not create separation and could not win outside. And that was a big reason why they didn't want to pay him the salary that he was slated to make in 2018. It's return on the investment. And the Dallas Cowboys thought they were not going to get that return, talking about a $12.5 million salary. With that, let's go to some of the top teams here for Des Bryant. And here is my list as we stand. I've got the Patriots at number one. I think they'd be an interesting location. I have not heard any buzz about New England calling up the Des Bryant camp or anything of the sort. So this is just... A Cam Rogers list here, not, you know, based off of any people I've talked to. Now, Seattle checks in at two. They've got a need at wide receiver. I don't have faith in Tyler Lockett or Marcus Johnson to be wide receiver number two on that team. So, Des Bryant obviously would fill a void there. San Francisco would be an interesting one. I don't think John Lynch wants to bring in Des Bryant. I think something synonymous here would be like the 76ers bringing in LeBron just kind of throwing a wrench into the process, if you will, kind of changing things up. San Francisco has a process. They have a good wide receiving core with Marquise Goodwin and Trent Taylor, who's going to be cemented as the slot receiver there. Got a couple of good receivers via the draft as well. Dante Pettis will be a good player. So I think San Francisco is going to be an interesting one to monitor. I'm not buying into it too much, though. The Colts make a lot of sense to me, although they went wide receiver a couple times. In the draft, they got a lot of salary cap space to make it happen. And then the Houston Texans. Contreras is saying the Texans sound more realistic. I agree. I think they're a sneaky one to watch out for. Will Fuller, obviously a great piece to that offense. DeAndre Hopkins is as good as they get at the wide receiver position. Des Bryant will not have to be the number one receiver for Houston. And I think that was part of the problem. He had to have been the number one receiver for the Dallas Cowboys the last few years, and he just was not. In the case of Houston, not as much pressure. And yeah, he's going to take a pay cut, and I think he's okay with that, at least from what I've been gathering. So Houston Texans, certainly a team to watch out for. My top five new landing spots for Des Bryant in the Des Bryant sweepstakes. All right, what's the latest on the New England Patriots and Tom Brady? So, add another chapter, folks, into the saga that is the New England Patriots organization. Tom Brady was present at the Milken Institute Global Conference, where Brady said he would, quote, plead the fifth on whether he feels appreciated by the New England Patriots. Now, Giselle Bunchen, Brady's wife, made some interesting comments in the Facebook documentary, Tom vs. Time, saying, quote, these last two years have been very challenging for him in so many ways, and he tells me, quote, I love it so much, and I just want to go to work and feel appreciated and have fun. Does that tell you Tom Brady 
does not feel appreciated, that he's not having fun with the New England Patriots right now. Yes, Rob Gronkowski is back, and that whole saga was kind of odd. But I do believe there is very real tension between Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. If you think back to that Seth Wickersham article, ladies and gentlemen, he referenced how Brady didn't like not receiving the Patriot of the Week award back in 2017. Didn't get it once. And Tom Brady won the MVP. That didn't sit well with him. And that made him feel insecure. It's not like Brady has this crazy ego where he needs to be fed week in and week out. He just wants to feel appreciated. And here's the root of the issue between Belichick and Brady. Because I do believe there is very real tension. Tom Brady is a believer in positive thinking. Holistic approaches to health. Positive energy. All this stuff. Bill Belichick is the exact opposite. Bill Belichick is petty. He's controlling. He's a micromanager. He's negative. He's pouty. All you have to do is look at one press conference with Bill Belichick, and you can automatically see the differences from a mental and personality standpoint between Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Brady reportedly told staff he has done too much to receive the grief that he currently does. To this point, Tom Brady is feeling insecure. He feels like, you know, he's not a part of the Patriot way, I guess. And Bill Belichick is hindering in that process. It's honestly not that far-fetched to think that these two are just not meshing anymore. Guys, this isn't Brady Belichick 2004, right? This is Brady Belichick 2018. Personalities change. Approaches change. Tom Brady is now a brand in of himself. He's a quasi-GM of the New England Patriots. He's a different man now than he was in 04 and 01 when he won that Super Bowl course against the LA Rams or the then St. Louis Rams. So apparently it's not working out with Belichick at this point now. All right? You know, it's the analogy. If you room with your best friend for too long, eventually things get a little sour between those two, right? Obviously, things are getting sour between Brady and Belichick, and the New England Patriots organization keeps feeding me information from all these leaks and all this stuff, and I really do enjoy talking about it on the Cam Rogers Show because it's just so surreal. A powerful trifecta among Kraft, Brady, and Belichick are now crumbling before us. Now, Vegas, obviously, not believing in that because they released the latest win projections and they got the New England Patriots at 11. So maybe Vegas should watch more of the Cam Rogers show. Just say. We got the Eagles at two. The Steelers are at two as well. They're both tied with 10 and a half. The Packers have 10. The Vikings have 10 as well. Those two are tied for fourth. Then we've got the Saints with nine and a half, the Rams with nine and a half, and then the Falcons, Panthers, and Jacksonville Jaguars, all with nine projected wins, according to the latest Vegas release. All right, so there you go. Which team will have the most wins in 2018? Hit me up in the reaction poll. Give me a like for the Eagles, a laughing face for the Patriots, a heart for the Vikings, and a... Wow face for the L.A. Rams. Let's get to the latest NFL headline here. And Barkley leading rookie jersey sales. Saquon Barkley to be exact. How about that? Followed by Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, and yes, Shaquem Griffin, the linebacker selected by the Seahawks. Now, I could go on a tangent here about Saquon and how it's an awesome selection for the Giants. However, my producer is telling me that I'm running out of time, so i got to get going on these headlines here. So let's get to Joe Flacco, who recently refused to speak to the media after being approached by ESPN's Jamison Hensley. He responded, I don't think I'm talking today. And this after, of course, the Ravens drafted Lamar Jackson. Joe Flacco is a guy who wants security. You saw there with the big-time contract that he got after winning the Super Bowl back in the 2000s or 2012-2013 season. There's four years left on his contract, but all the guaranteed money is gone after this season. Joe Flacco is feeling the pressure with Lamar Jackson now in town, ladies and gentlemen. Look out. Joe better step up his play. And this coming from a Ravens fan. 
And I think he will. He's going to put in some extra time with Michael Crabtree, John Brown, and Willie Sneed, the new receivers there in Charm City. So with one AMC North quarterback, here's another. Ben Roethlisberger. He's going to play three to five more years, which is so interesting that, uh, well, I mean, he said last year that maybe he didn't have it anymore. Remember after that Jacksonville Jaguars game when he threw five interceptions? Count them, five and he said, maybe I just don't have it anymore. I'm not putting too much stock into this. I don't think Ben Roethlisberger plays five more years, guys. He is not going to be in the NFL when uh, 2023 comes around. He just won't be. He has floated the retirement talk so many times. Now, Roethlisberger was recently speaking on the matter because, of course, the Steelers recently drafted Mason Rudolph, quarterback out of Oklahoma State. And, uh, yeah, Ben Roethlisberger did say he will play somewhat of a mentor type of role, though. But now he's feeling the pressure. Now he wants to uh, throw out a timeline. Three to five more years for Ben Roethlisberger, according to him. I don't believe that. You probably shouldn't either. All right, those are your latest NFL headlines here on the Cam Rogers Show. I hope you enjoyed today's programming. If you missed any of it, don't you worry. Keep it right here on this video. I will be back here on Friday morning for episode 99, falling right in line with my Twitter handle, 10 o'clock Eastern time. I'll see you then.